Hi, it's Kathy Schmitz, and I wanted to share with you some different stitch ideas for the East Moreland pattern. That's the one with all these little houses. And the fun thing about this pattern is that everybody can use their own idea of what stitches they want to use and what little additions they want to use. If they want to add rickrack or beads or buttons to make it their own. So every neighborhood's going to look a little different. Um, I also wanted to show you how to, if you, since you already have a pattern, how to make these little pins, these little brooches, and they're kind of fun to wear too. So we'll make those and then I'll show you some different ideas on how to do the numbers in case you're wondering how I did those. So follow along and I'll show you um, some different ideas. Thanks. Here's the supply list for the East Moreland pattern. You're gonna need two mini charm packs of the Moda Home Fabric Line. And this fabric line will be in stores in August of 2019. You'll also need a piece of black flannel, 21 by 26 inches, Valdani thread, or you can use a six strand a DMC or some other sort of floss, you'll want to stitch with two strands of the floss if you're going to go that route. You need a piece of a lightweight fusible web. Um, I like to use the Soft Fuse Premium. Lightweight's important so because we're going to be stitching through several layers. Then you'll need a nice lightweight piece of batting and then other options to make your piece unique. Uh, you can add buttons, rickrack, ivory beads, ribbon, uh, charms, anything else you can think of. And to finish it off, we're going to wrap it around a piece of 16 by 20 inch wrapped canvas that's one inch in depth. You can pick these up at your craft store. I would pick up an inexpensive one because you're not going to be painting on it. It's just going to be used as the frame. And then it will be secured in place using a staple gun. So the final thing would be a staple gun to attach the finished embroidery piece to the frame. So the first step in making the East Moreland wall hanging pattern is to have a piece of black flannel, which is 22 by 26 inches. You will fold this in half horizontally and then vertically to find the center this will help you block out that center 15 by 19 inch rectangle that you'll need. I couldn't find a marking tool that I liked to use on this black flannel, so that is why I went ahead and used basting stitches. This worked great. So just stitch with basting stitches the 15 by 19 inch rectangle in the center of your black flannel. Now we have the basting stitches in place and we can start making our small cross stitches. These are going to be about a quarter of an inch in height and width. Um, when I say about, I really mean just about. Mine are nowhere near perfect. If you'd like to make them perfect, you're more than welcome to, but I kind of like my imperfections. So the top of the cross stitches are going to go right up against the basting stitches and they're going to go out towards the border or the edge of the fabric. And that's about a quarter of an inch wide. The next step is to do the perpendicular lines that go out from the cross stitch. These are going to be spaced about a quarter of an inch apart and about one and a half inches in length. Again, I emphasize about. I like to use a piece of quarter inch tape that I cut to about a one and a half inches in length, and then I can just lay it down, stitch along the side, move it, stitch along the side, and continue on and on until I get them done. You're going to go straight out from the corners. You don't do anything in the corners as far as those are concerned. And again, this is using a stem stitch. To prepare your fabric pieces, you will need some lightweight fusible web. I like to use the Soft Fuse Premium, but there are a lot of different ones out there that will work well. You just don't want to use something too heavy because you're going to be stitching through it and that can be kind of hard on your fingers. Um, what you want to do is arrange the squares on your fusible web and overlap them just by the width of that pinked edge. You don't want any fusible web uh, showing between them to get stuck on the iron or anything. So you do need to overlap them just a tiny bit. 
And the other helpful thing is to alternate light and darks so that from the back side, as you can see in this picture, you can see where those blocks are because you'll need to see those when you're tracing your design. If you have excess fabric like I do in this picture, what I did is I just cut that off and then I, I just ironed it onto another piece of fusible web. There will be extra fabric squares, so you don't have to apply all of them to fusible web. Um, you'll need uh, 30 houses, doors, and roofs, and then one bird and bird house, or more if you want. So each house will fit on one square. So you know you're gonna need at least 30 fabric squares just for the house part. Then you're gonna need another 30 or so for the roofs. Some of the roofs, you can fit a door on the same block as a roof. So I would recommend picking and choosing the fabrics you want to use, adhering at least you know 50 of them to a fusible web, and then you can always add more if you need more. And um, there'll be house, door, and roof pieces. So when you trace these, you wanna make sure, first of all, that you uh, trace the same amount of houses as doors, as roofs, so you have one to go with the other, and that you mix up the light and dark fabrics so that you don't have all light houses with all dark roofs. Um, same with the doors, so mix them all up. Um, the other thing is when you're laying them out, try not to overlap the um, different fabrics. So you want a house to be out of one fabric, um, not half on one fabric and half on the other. And another idea is to flip the template over and that will give you a mirror image to just mix it up a little bit more and give you some more options. That really only works on a couple of the roofs that are directional, but it's a thought and something you might wanna try. Now that you have all your pieces cut out, it's time to start arranging. There will be six houses in a row and you're going to have five horizontal rows. I like the way it looks to move the houses about just a little bit so they're not all exactly lined up like a cookie cutter neighborhood. I live in an old neighborhood where every house is different and, and I, I love that. I like having it be unique. So I tried to do that on this design too when I laid my houses out. Um, this will be fun because you can kind of play around and decide, okay, do I have too many light colored houses in a row, too many dark houses? Do I wanna switch this roof with that roof until you get it looking the way you'd like? Um, it's important to keep the houses and roofs uh, about a half an inch away from the cross stitch border that goes all the way around. So lay these out in an order that uh, you like. So first of all, I'd like to show you what I did to get the numbers on my houses. And you can choose to put numbers on or not, it's your choice. So I had originally made, had some ribbon made um, with some numbers on it. And this is what I included in my kit. So if you bought a kit, then this is what you received. And what I would recommend doing on this is when you cut them apart, add a little bit of fray check or just, you know, white glue or something to keep it from fraying on the ends. So if you don't have numbered ribbon, then there are a few other options. On the original one that I made, I actually used little rubber stamps, wooden stamps with numbers on them that I found at Michael's years ago. And I got the whole set for um, not too much, just a few dollars. But um, this stuff, the Memento Lux, it's made to use on things like fabric. And um, if you want to, you can heat set it with an iron. But since this isn't going to be washed, it doesn't really matter. But I'll show you, there's an example of that. It stamps real easily. And um, I'll do number three here. It's kind of fun then because you can personalize and do your own address if you want or numbers that mean something to you or whatnot. So that's one option. Now, if you do that, leave some space in between so that you can cut them apart. And again, I would probably use some fray check or something around the edges just to keep them stable. And then the other option, what I did is I printed out some numbers 
and I printed them about 3 8 inch in height. And I just, you know, randomly picked some numbers and left some space in between, printed it out. And then with the fabric that I'm going to use, I ironed a piece of freezer paper on the back. And what that'll do, it makes it nice to draw on. The fabric doesn't wiggle around. So with a light box then, I'll line that back up. I can trace these numbers. So I initially tried using a red Sharpie, which, you know, Sharpies are great for writing on fabric. They work really well. But I didn't know if the red was a little too red for the red that I'm looking for. Because what I did, is I used um, this Valdani thread. Actually, that doesn't look too bad. Those two together. Uh, the other option, I found some this other felt pen that's a little bit deeper shade of red. So I could do that too. And if it isn't thick enough, if you want your numbers to be more pronounced, you can always make them a little bit thicker. Um, there's a lot of different fonts you could choose. You could do some fun things like adding little, little accents like that. So anyway, so those are your choices for doing numbers using a pen too. Uh, the other option is to, with this freezer paper ironed on the back, if you trimmed this to exactly eight and a half by 11, you could print these right on the fabric and just choose whatever color you wanted to use. So those are some ideas for the numbers that I wanted to go over. And what I would do is use a little bit of fabric glue. So once I've cut them out to hook, you know, to attach them to my houses before I actually stitch them down, I just would use a little bit of glue or before you cut them apart, you could put some uh, fusible web on the back and iron them on. So those are some choices on that. Following the manufacturer's directions for whichever fusible web you decided to use, iron your houses in place once you have them all arranged the way you'd like them and any added pieces like the numbers or um, any other kind of ribbon. Now the fun begins. Now you can start doing your embroidery stitches. This is the part that I enjoyed the most. And there's a lot of different stitches that I include in the pattern and you can mix and match which stitches you use where. You can alternate from one side of the house to the other. So on one side, you might do a whip stitch. On the other side, you could do a feather stitch. There's French knots, cross stitches. You can add a rickrack and stitch over the rickrack to hold it in place. If you use rickrack, I would add a little glue on the cut end so it doesn't ravel. Um, just make sure since these are adhered to flannel and you're going to be handling it quite a bit that they are all the little pieces are stitched down in some way or another. It can be a running stitch, um, any variety of stitches, but just something to hold them in place. The final thing you'll be stitching are the trees. These are going to be centered between the houses. Again, they're not lined up in a straight line. They're more organic, like the house placement. You start with a stem stitch that goes straight up between the two houses and you stitch a little V at the top of that. And then you can come down and add a branch or two or three, depending on how much room you have between the houses. And just add a little V at the end of each of the branches. I went ahead and added a little berry or apple at the end of these using the red floss. A friend of mine really loves eggplant, so she was going to do hers in an eggplant purple, which I think will look really pretty too. So you can mix and match the colors that you'd like um, that fit in your home or that are just more appealing to you. And once you have this, the trees all stitched up, then your piece is ready to frame. To finish your piece, you'll want to mount it onto a 16 by 20 inch wrapped canvas frame. These can be found at any craft store. I found mine at Michael's. It was on sale for $7, which is a lot less expensive than a 16 by 20 inch frame would be. Um, mine is one inch in depth. 
you will take your finished embroidery piece and place it face down on a table. Then you're going to take your piece of light batting and place it on top of the back of the finished embroidery piece. And then you're going to put your canvas face down on top of this. So you're making a sandwich with the um, batting in between. This just gives it a little bit more texture. Now you're going to pull the edge of the four sides from the center to the back and using a piece of tape, uh, I know this will be temporary, this is not how you're going to finish it, but you can tape it in place, flip the canvas over to see if it's centered the way you like it. If it, it needs adjusting, make adjustments. If it's good, then continue to tape around the edges until you get the corners looking the way you want them and the sides looking nice and straight. Once you get that where you'd like it positioned to stay, you're going to flip it back over again so the back of the canvas is facing up and then use a staple gun to staple right through the flannel into the wood of the wrapped canvas frame. These always have a wood frame, so that makes it helpful. Uh, tape won't work permanently because it's not going to stick to the flannel very well. There might be other options you could use, like glue. Um, the nice thing about a staple gun is you can get it taut, and it will stay nice and taut. If you used glue, it's going to move on you. The other option would be to use really long stitches and stitch from one side to the other through the flannel. But the staple gun seemed to be the best way to go for me. And now you have a finished piece of artwork that you can hang on your wall that's unique and all your own. I hope you enjoyed making this. Thank you. But wait, there's more. Since you have the pattern, why not make little house pins? I kind of got carried away and I made a few dozen <laughs> or so. You can use any combination of house and roof and door that you want with letters and buttons or anything else. And what I did is I stitched these onto a piece of wool. So I used a larger piece of wool and stitched several of them onto one piece. Once they were stitched, I cut them out leaving about 3 eighths of an inch around uh, each piece so um, there was extra wool showing around the whole house. Then I cut a matching piece of wool for the backing. And then you take a pin back and stitch it to the back of the wool that's going to be the backing. It's easier to do this before you stitch the front and the back together. I would recommend doing it beforehand. Speaking from experience. Okay, and then finally, you take the front and the back and you're just going to whip stitch all the way around the sides. And then you have a cute little pin that you can wear on your jacket or give to a friend. Thanks, enjoy. Thank you so much for watching this tutorial. If you enjoyed it or learned something from it, I hope you will click like, and I would love it if you'd also follow me so you don't miss any new tutorials. Thank you.